All right. Got some great people here today. Hey, Jim, welcome back from California. Tracy, Calgary, Heather, Calgary. Snowy Calgary. Oh, okay. Trevor, welcome from Edmonton. Wow, Calgary's snowy and cold, huh? Okay, I don't feel so bad about the foggy. I can't complain too much about that. It's about 65 degrees here. Wow, yeah, Jim, things, uh, things are very different in California. Hope it doesn't get out of control. All right, but it's 103, so we will get started. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for Create Your Virtual Breakthrough and Gain More Clients with this opener. Really excited to talk about this topic. I think it is so uh, relevant and important. The last time we did this presentation was about four months ago during the middle of the summer. And you know we were already uh, experiencing how much things have changed in terms of the world and the business world moving virtual. And a lot of our networking, a lot of our meetings, um, prospecting has moved so much to virtual forums and I'm it's a little bit different everywhere about how much we got have gotten back to normal I'm not sure anywhere has completely I know here in New York you know we're not really doing in-person events just yet and you know even last night I did a speed network event a uh, speed networking event virtually that was a lot of fun so you know hopefully everybody here is still so much so eager to get out and meet people spread the word about your amazing businesses or your missions and uh we're going to talk today about how to start the conversation how to draw someone in and create the interest that can lead to the meeting and ultimately to the business myself and I know some of you uh, have, have met me virtually before. Uh, just to give a little bit of a uh, rundown of my background, I have been working in some form of sales for over 10 years since I was in college. While I was in college, I was working retail sales. And uh, in about 20, the end of 2013, or early 2014, I started with Equinox Fitness as a real deal commission salesperson. And I had a lot of success right off the bat because I had a wonderful sales training. And one of the interesting things is one of the things about that sales training that they cover on the first day is the concept of elevator pitch and sparking conversation to create that interest. And back, back then, which isn't too long ago, I know, but for me, um, it is because of how much things have changed for myself. Uh, it was very old school. And on the first day of sales training, our, our director of sales, what would happen is lunchtime would come and he would say, all right, well, guess what? Trial by fire. You all, your job is to go out on your lunch break, to come back or don't come back with three leads, contact information, three people you spoke to and are interested now in potentially joining a club. Wow, that was very scary. Create a lot of anxiety, a lot of nervousness, and it can it can still feel that way today, right? You know, if a lot of times we can be caught off guard by that question, you know, who are you and what do you do? Or, or if we're the ones that have to proactively spark that conversation. And we changed it a little bit as I um, started doing the sales training myself. So after about a year in sales, uh, sales role, I was promoted to regional sales manager started to train our teams in the New York tri-state area. And uh, for the last four years while I was with Equinox, I was leading sales training uh, on that Monday, teaching the concept of elevator pitch to, you know, during my time, over 1,000 of our salespeople and employees and executives. And we, after a certain amount of time, we did not do the go out and lunch and don't come back until you have three leads. We did a different exercise where it's like you're waiting in line at Starbucks and your job is to spark a conversation and get someone interested enough to give you their contact info and, and set up a time to meet with you um, to experience the club. And that was very useful to me. And it's very useful to the salespeople that I have trained. 
Not so much because we're actually going up to strangers in Starbucks and sparking conversations, but the skill to be able to do that is going to make every other conversation when you are in front of a prospect or you are at a networking event that much easier. And in this year, of course, I joined KO Advantage Group and recently joined full time. Um, so I am pumped for that next step. Who are we? For anyone who is here and not familiar, we give you the only sales process built on connecting clients with emotional intelligence for high value deals for B2B services. We give you more sleep to predict the size and the number of the deals that are coming in. We give you the empowerment to focus on the right clients, the high value clients. They're gonna pay you the prices that you're looking for, right? We do not want to focus. Hopefully you are not focusing on trying to close anything with a pulse and a credit card. Sometimes we feel that way. Sometimes we get stuck in that, in that, in that rut. The more we can refine, the more we can choose, the more we go after the right clients, it'll save us time, money, energy, and streamline the entire rest of our sales process. Less anxiety and less uncertainty, right? And there's, we all know there's enough anxiety and uncertainty in the world today. Let's not have it with our sales process when sales, like anything else, is a skill, a learnable skill. It's like learning a musical instrument. It takes time, it takes practice, but there is a method, there is a theory. And if you put the time in, you get to make music. So I ask everyone here, we'll start out with this question. How confident are you in your opener? Let me know in the chat. You can do a scale of one to 10 if you like. One being horribly not confident, 10 being incredibly confident. Go ahead and let me know. All right, I see a seven from Caroline, a six from Colinda. Good, good. Room for improvement there. Okay, six to seven, depending on the audience. Jim, awesome. So my goal is, you know, for us, as we continue through this presentation, and by the time we end this presentation and take some action, you know, we're gonna work on increasing those numbers. Oh no, Tasha, four. <laughs> okay, don't be too hard on yourself. We're gonna get that up. The first thing we're gonna do is step back and take, it the, take a look at the evolution of the value proposition, how this has changed because it has changed over time in sales. It has gone through a journey. Where it started and where it was for a long time was all about the seller. I have a product that you want. Come on down. Do you, do you want what I have? My product is completely different. I have the solution about us. I have something. Do you want it? I have something. Here's why you want it. Eventually, we got a little bit more sophisticated. And we learn that the prospects, prospects are suffering different pains. And if we can just identify and understand those pains and, and, and kind of surface, surface those pains and give them oxygen, now we can create some value and some uh, you know, awareness around the need to change. What are the areas that pain the prospect the most, right? It was a, a constant conversation. Does the prospect suffer this pain? Do you suffer from this pain? And you'd be able to throw that out there. Hey, do you suffer from this? Is this something you're experiencing? Yes, okay, wonderful. Well, guess what? My products will help you relieve that. And that is you know, still an okay way to go. Definitely better than the first version. Ultimately now we've arrived at a point where we understand that the prospect has goals. And it's important to understand that because yes, our prospects are in pain, but with the internet and Google and the, the web MD culture where we go online and try to find the solution to our problems ourselves. And oftentimes we believe we are alleviating that pain. Now we have to find a different way to resonate, to be relevant, to be impactful. Understanding the prospect and the business has goals is that way. 
right? Where someone is at and where they want to be are two different places. We deserve, we deserve to, to be there, to be at the place that we know we can be. What are those goals though? And how can we help them achieve them faster, right? So if, if you can really understand what is someone's specific goals for where they want to be, and now provide a solution to help them achieve those goals faster, now you have created true value. Because it's not just alleviating a current pain. Now we're talking about how this person's gonna feel when they reach that next level, when they reach those goals in the future and who will they be? And now we're tapping into identity and identity in terms of psychology and in terms of human behavior is the most powerful driver. There's a lot of synonymous terms in, uh, when we talk about openers and starting conversations. There's unique selling position, there's value proposition, there's elevator pitch. Unique selling position, it, now when we distinguish, what makes you different is really the, the unique selling position. What makes you unique? The reason someone wants to do business with you, how, how do you stand out? You know, Seth Godin talks about this from a marketing standpoint, what makes you a purple cow? Hopefully you are a purple cow. Hopefully you are remarkable. Hopefully you are memorable. What is your it factor? That is one level. Another level is value proposition. Now value proposition, a statement about what someone will receive when they work with you. So what is the value and what is the return on my investment? We want to we wanna be really strong here about what that return investment is. And a lot of times in the value proposition is when we'll see dollar amounts, we'll see percentages and other things that are quantifiable. And then we have the elevator pitch. And the whole concept of the elevator pitch is, you know, the traditional, like, what if you were, you know, uh, an upstart, like, a, you know, a, a, a scrappy young uh, entrepreneur, and you had a great idea, and you happened to be in the elevator with the CEO in, the, in this high rise, and now you're going up 10 floors or 20 floors, and you had, this was your chance, right? And like, how in, in, in 20 seconds or less would you summarize your big, bold idea? And how, and how it could actually make a difference to change the entire direction of the company. We still have those conversations. They may not be on elevators, especially at the moment. However, the elevator pitch is still something that's very relevant, but what has changed about the elevator pitch, aside from where we might be doing them, is the length. So the elevator pitch of 20 seconds, far too long nowadays. We really wanna be focused on like, eight seconds or less. And we'll talk more about brevity as we continue here. But uh, some, some people may have heard this. I mean, does anyone know how long the human attention span is estimated to be currently? And Caroline says six seconds. Yes, about six to seven seconds is the correct answer. I will not wait any longer because I don't want to lose attention spans, but yes, it is less than a goldfish. So we need to be aware of that. What is the intention of an opener? What do you think the intention of the opener is? Let me know. Go ahead. Okay, good. So Tasha, get, grab the attention in that six seconds. Jay, to get started with the conversation, get the person's attention. Okay, good. Yes. So you, you're all on the right track. And, and sometimes a lot of people say, you know, get the meeting. Yes, ultimately. But if you're focused on like getting the meeting from the opener, you're putting a lot of weight on it. When in reality, one, yes, you're trying to get the attention, spark interest. But how will you know when you've succeeded is when you've started a conversation when they are asking you questions. We know this is not gonna be a one-sided conversation. It's not gonna be um, just kind of sentence after sentence of what you do, no matter how great you are, it's not gonna matter. Spark the interest, have them ask a question, 
get the conversation going. Because if we want to sigh, oh, here we go again. Start with I. And that is what we see, unfortunately, so many times, right? So sorry to break it to everyone. We should all agree. It's not about us. Why do so many elevator pitches and openers suck? Because they start with I and they are me focused. I help businesses reduce their expenditures and increase their efficiencies. I work on making HR teams uh, more uh, fulfilling and um, community-based organizations. You've heard it all before. Nobody cares. That's not really going to spark my interest. Again, the intention span being seven seconds or less, right? We want to always remember what is in it for them? What is the benefit? It should be all about the benefit to the person you're speaking to. And that is that kind of paradigm shift that we want to take away from this presentation. And we're going we're gonna to focus on two things, right? As we start to change that paradigm, as we start to try to make these more refined, here's two things to make a note of. Number one, what do you want someone to feel? Number two, what do you want someone to do? These are things we should be considering when we're creating our opening lines or our elevator pitches. And this, this is, these are great questions. It reminds me of, I'm a big fan of the Tim Ferriss podcast, and he has great interviews with a lot of people from all over the, the spectrum in terms of celebrities, entrepreneurs, um, authors, you name it. And he has a great question that he asked them that I love. And it's, if you had a billboard and you were able only to put one thing on that builder, billboard, whether it be a quote, a couple words or a sentence, what would you put? And you learn a lot about people from their answer from that. And this is what it reminds me of. Because a lot of times the question is what they want someone to feel or ultimately what they want someone to do has a lot to do with our values and the impact we want to help others make. These are the two questions though that we want to use as our starting point. Keeping in mind also transportation versus destination. And hopefully this is, you know, a consistent, thorough theme message in those of us who have joined us for webinars before or who are students in our programs. Never want to lose sight of this because this is what we're selling. When an airline sells a vacation package, they are focusing on it sucks to be where you are right now, right? It's not very nice. Uh, in, in, in New York during the winter, during the late spring. Apparently it's not very nice in Calgary, although I'm sure it's beautiful, um, but weather-wise, it might not be very nice compared to how amazing it would be to be in Cancun, to be sitting on that beach, the warm sand, the warm breeze, the cold beer in our hand, the soft music playing, Oh, I mean, that, that, that is amazing. I know, Tasha, I could handle a Cancun visit right now. Me too. My gosh, anywhere south of, um, south of the lower states, I would love to be. And airlines know this better than any, anyone else because an airline is not focusing you on the transportation. They're focusing you on the destination. But what do they really sell? They want, they, they, they want you to believe they're selling you that vacation, that adventure, that excursion. What they're, what they're really though selling you on a literal standpoint is a seat on a plane. They're renting you a seat on the plane. And if they focused on how terrible it could be to go through security and TSA and how cramped and claustrophobic we might feel on the plane and 
what that experience might, might be like in terms of a smooth flight or turbulence or um, what it feels like to, to sit on a plane for eight hours. I mean, ultimately a lot less people would be going on vacations. We, we don't want to focus on how we're going to get there. We want to focus on where we're going, what it's going to look like and what it's going to feel like. So again, for our openers, we should be painting that picture in the, sh in the most concise way possible of what it will look like and what it will feel like to be there, to be where we are taking our clients. A great question to ask is what do our clients ultimately get when they use your services? We talked about the airlines, right? What do clients ultimately get when they use their services? Go ahead and let me in the know in the chat. Would love to hear. Everyone's thinking, there are no wrong answers. This is a safe space. And that's what you all get today is a safe space. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, Caroline, innovation, culture, engaged employees, less turnover, better leadership. Love it. Yes, because those are, those are the end results. Those are not, those are destinations. Those are not transportation. So awesome. Jim, employees are able to plan for a dignified and financially sound retirement. Yes. Okay. Right. Dignity. I mean, that's like a serious, I mean, that is, that is a feeling. Um, and, and that, that is something that who doesn't want that, right? Tasha, mine is along the lines of taking the stress out of their safety and compliance program. Yes. Okay. So we're on the right track though, right? It's not about what that safety or compliance program looks like. It's about the, it's about the, the taking the stress out of it. And now when you no longer have that stress, how will you feel? What will you be able to achieve and focus on? And where will you be able to take your business next? Because whew, I'm not stressing over that anymore. The value proposition. So the value proposition is a selling statement that allows someone to be clear on what you do. And it focuses on the solution and does not mention the product or service. And it puts the listener in the position of imagining how it impact their life when they are in the process of using their service regularly, right? So when we're on the right track here, so great to see in the comments, right? Because if some of us are putting the, the user, the client, the listener in the experience viscerally of what it will feel like after, you know, what it will feel like is, is when, when they're using it or experiencing it is one thing, but what will it feel like after they've used it regularly? And we can start to put these together. We can break these down into, into elements, okay? And here's how we'll do that. So first, and this is optional, is you can include who your in client is, uh, ideal client, step number one. Who is that person? Who is the, the, the buyer persona, the ideal client that you are looking for, that you are looking to serve consistently in a repeatable way, whether it be that person's business over the long term or more people like them? Two, what are they suffering from? So we are going to go back and draw a little bit from the value proposition that talks about the pain points. What are those pain points? Because that, what that does is that allows us to create a contrast. It's not just about the pain. Why? Why change now? What's the opportunity cost? What will happen if they don't change? What are the negative consequences? What are the positive consequences the, 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 the positive results that will not be reaped now because that change was not made. And then when they do reap those positive results and make that change, how will their business ultimately improve? What does that beautiful destination look like? What does Cancun look like for them? Here's a silly example. 
For the tired mother who wakes up at 3 a.m. when her baby is crying for a feeding, who, instead of waiting for water to boil in order to warm the formula, costing her precious sleep, she will be able to heat up the bottle perfectly in less than 30 seconds and be back in her warm bed to get the rest she desperately needs. And only imagine if we could take that further, this is, you know, we don't wanna to be too long, but imagine who that mother, mother will be tomorrow, right? With, with getting the rest that she, that she needed. And we don't even know in this example what exactly it is, you can take guesses, but we don't even know exactly what it is that is being sold. But if this was presented to the right person, any parent, it hopefully will create the interest in someone to question, huh, tell me more about that. What you got for me? That sounds great. Silly example number two, as your company grew from one to 10 employees, who? This is now, we, we're getting more specific about the size of the business and the age of the business that we are speaking to. The number of applications you're using also grew to over 20 that do redundant tasks leading to moments when valuable files became lost. That is the what, the what is the pain? What is the problem? You're showing that you understand a problem that they are going through. Reduce search time when you integrate and use only four robust programs. Why would you want to make this change? Well, because there's a better way, right? And that's ultimately what we're saying with the why. Well, why do it that way? when there's a better way. Allowing you to have consistency, efficiency, and more time to spend serving your clients instead of recreating files. How will this change you and your business when you do find this better way? Who, what, why, how? Why don't we talk about the product? We're creating solutions. Our product and our service, they're, they're, it's, it's not about the, it is about the solution, not about what the actual um, usage of, is in terms of the features of the product. For example, we, I think we would all agree, right? No one wants an alarm clock. They wanna wake up on time. No one needs a car except for car enthusiasts, right? But we can, we can also talk about the different reason why they need that car. They need a form of transportation that will get them quick, easily, and conveniently from point A to point B, right? Sometimes it's a status symbol. And Seth Godin, again, talks about this so well. He talks about the concept of one of the biggest breakthroughs in marketing was when they figured out you know, for example, the person who, who wants a drill, they don't want a drill. They don't want a tool. What they want is a hole in the wall. And, and Seth took it even further, right? As we continue to build our understanding of how to market and how to sell to people is actually they don't want a hole in the wall. Nobody wants a hole in the wall. I don't want a hole in the wall. What they want is the shelf that, they're, that they need to attach through that hole or the bookshelf or the, the frame photo of their, their loved one or the, the incredible art that makes them feel some type of emotion, some type of status, some type of identity, feel a part of some type of tribe. That's why they want the hole. So we can keep going further and further and further with this third box thinking. We can't go too far though, because we have to communicate this in a quick and compelling way. As Mark Twain says, had I had more time, I would have written you a shorter letter. So that is the challenge, right? How can we, how can we acknowledge, right, in a, in a third box way, the real reasons why this person would find value in this product or service, but communicate it, at least begin the process of starting of a conversation in a very quick, concise way, right? Because we, we live, live in a world with sensory, sensory overload. We're marketed to 
I forget what they say, hundreds, thousands of times per day, right? We live in the world where we tap into social media and we scroll through a feed where we're going through hundreds of people and their messages. We have thousands of contacts, right? We need something that's going to resonate and, and stick through and stick, number one, cut through the clutter. So that starts with refining our elevator pitch to get it to be more like a seven or eight second statement at the longest. And the good news is once we do this, once we, you know, once we find a way to say this concisely, it's going to translate to all of our, the entire sales process. It's going to make our emails easier and more efficient. It's going to make our phone calls easier and more efficient, our marketing materials, our social media posts. Again, we're not focusing on the product. We want to focus on the benefit to the client. There's a great book uh, by Dan Pink, To Sell as Human. And I did actually read this uh, around eight years ago uh, when I was starting at Equinox uh, as a salesperson. And one of the great things about this book is it's, it's written for someone who it's written for non-salespeople, right? It's one of those messages that's, that's like, you know, to sell as human, it's something we all do and it's something natural. So many people have this trepidation or anxiety or negative stereotypes or connotations about what sales is. And I think nobody better than Dan Pink, who is himself also not a quote unquote salesperson. So maybe that's why it was so well done. Um, I think nobody better than Dan Ping explained why sales is human and also just a good thing for a society and social connection overall. He spent some time in the book talking about how the elevator pitch has evolved as well and how, um, you know, those who have had success have, have found a way to make it more relevant and make it shorter and make it stickier. One way is making it a question. So, and, and this is, you know, this has been done before. So for example, you know, in the past, are you better off today than you were four years ago? And that's that, I believe that started with like Ronald Reagan, uh, but that is like a classic political question now because that is something they want um, people thinking about before they make their decision to vote. Are you better off today than you were four years ago? Or how do you know when the, the, the how do you know when is the right time to hire HR services? Good question. Um, getting people to think, and this could be an open-ended question, and this can be a closed-ended question. And you know, example that that I always think of in terms of asking a question to start a conversation is from the show How I Met Your Mother. I'm a huge fan, and I'm not sure if anybody on here has seen the show. However, uh, a quite famous line is from the character Barney Stinson, who always starts out um, as the, the ultimate wingman for his friend Ted Mosby, because he can start a conversation that leads to great places simply by grabbing someone and saying, have you met Ted? And, 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 you know, I mean, it's like, uh, no, I haven't met Ted. And, you know, I even took that a little bit in my sales career when I was working at Equinox. One of my favorite questions when I called someone or spoke to someone, one of the easiest ways to make it natural was to say, you know, have you ever had a chance to experience the club before? And if, you know, a lot of times they would say no, um, it was like, oh, well, you know, let's have, let's, let's change that. Let's get you in here to experience the club. It was like, it becomes reason enough to do it because you haven't. And if you have done it and then never committed or taken action, that conversation could go in a different direction. Uh, but starting with a question is a really powerful way. Rhyming as well. Rhyming's, rhyming sticks. This is proven over and over again through uh, psychology and social science. We, you know, so many of us remember the, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit, or takes a lick in, keeps on ticking for Timex. I also am a big fan of boxing. And, you know, Muhammad Ali is famous for foot, uh, foot like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Your hands can't hit what your eyes can't see. And even today, there's a, there's a boxing referee. And I, in my opinion, he is the best boxing referee in the world. His name is Kenny Bayless. And before the fight, when we're about to we're about to go, you know, a lot of referees will bring the fighters together, make them touch gloves, and say something like, "All right, well, you know the rules, blah 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 blah." Not memorable, and I don't even know how effective they are. This referee says, "You know, all right, boys, or you know, whoever, uh, touch gloves. Whatever I say, you must obey," and boom, they go. 
And like one that resonated, that's I'll never that sticks with me. But you have to think that also sticks with the fighters. Whatever I say, you must obey. Whatever I say, you must obey. Probably explains why he has such great um, results when he does referee in the ring. One word as well as an opportunity for an elevator pitch, right? And here we we kind of cross the line between branding and advertising, but that's a good thing. This is a good exercise to do because a brand at a, you know what is a brand? A brand is identity, values, and and character, right? The embodiment of of a company or an enterprise. Um, the same for us as people. Ultimately, how can we how can we communicate that in one word? Going back to like the billboard question um, from Tim Ferriss, if you could put one, one word or one sentence on a billboard, what would you put? Because it explains so much about you. For MasterCard, it's priceless. For Google, it's search, right? And, and, and you know, so many businesses are coming up with, with taglines, right? Whether it's one word or more, that relates to something else. So not on here is kind of like a, a, an analogy or a metaphor, right? Is another way. So for example, you know, Google's in the press right now um, for because they're being sued by the United States government. And this is opening up an opportunity for a search engine called DuckDuckGo. But their tagline is the search engine that doesn't track you. That that cuts, you know, that cuts through because, you know, who we all, you know, we all to some degree value our privacy and value not being tracked and, and feel some kind of anxiety or fear about that happening too much in today's society. Caroline, yes, duck, duck, go. <laughs> I'm going to start using it. Like I really am. I'm going to start using because that, that tagline really hit me hard. Um, and, you know, again, for, for, for a, like a metaphor and analogy, how many times have you heard somebody say that they're like the, for a startup, they're like the Uber of XYZ or they're like the Airbnb of XYZ and, and that stuff gets overplayed, but there's a reason why people use it because it does help people make sense of something. I was speed networking last night and most of the people I met, I, you know, it didn't stick. It's not really memorable. One person did stick today and, and, and not because the business is particularly relevant to me or what I do. Uh, it's actually, she, she, writes, um, she writes technology code for microwave technology. And, but ultimately she was explaining her website and she said, you know, it's like the Wikipedia for microwave technology. And I was like, oh, all right, well, I can, that I can understand a little bit about like what you mean now, because now you've related to something I use. Subject lines. So when we do reduce these taglines and these, these one to two to five word statements, now we can use these as subject lines to drive curiosity, right? Already give some kind of indication of what the benefit will be to that person and why they would even want to spend the time to open that email. And we want to do it in a specific way. So as an example, you know, three simple ways to get more evil, uh, email subscribers, the best formula to lose 10 pounds in 30 days. Now, those are only going to be as effective as the person you're sending it to, but at least it is specific. There's a benefit illustrated. And because you're not specifically saying what it is, it's driving curiosity. Twitter, you know, how can we do this in 140 characters or less? Uh, is another great challenge. You know, how can we do this so it fits into a LinkedIn tagline? That's so important nowadays to put what you do, how you help people. What is the benefit for the person who, the potential client who's looking at, looking at your LinkedIn profile? Are they able to find that? Are they able to find that in a sentence? So the challenge today for everyone here is to spend some time and create that opener if you haven't already, and if you have, maybe look at it again, right? Things change always. How can we make it better? But if not, create an opener that you could use that's five words or less. It sums up now how you benefit and how you make an impact, how you want the person to feel and how, what you want them to do. And it, is this asking a lot? Yes. However, put the time in, refine it because there's nothing more important now than being able to cut through this virtual and digital clutter, because this is, this is where we are and this is where we will be.
Love it. Jim, yes. Planning for a dignified retirement. I love that. I think that's great. Who doesn't want a dignified retirement? What do you want them to do? Plan. Very nice. Of course, there's, you know, we're going to use this in a variety of ways. Taglines, again, for LinkedIn or other places. Headlines for blog posts if we're creating content. Our website, we want to have that right, right on the landing page. Business cards, potentially. Email signature, maybe. Networking introductions, for sure. Social media and other marketing materials. What I ask is that everyone embraces this mentality of application is an education is not application. I, and I commend all of you. I give you a virtual high five because you've been doing a great job in the chat today, applying this, right? This is only going to get you so far as the time you put in now to apply and refine. So much I like to compare learning sales like a musical instrument. You know, I can tell you about piano all day long. I can, I could spend three hours a week with you telling you about piano, but guess what? If you sit down, if you haven't practiced or you haven't put the keys, uh, fingers to the keys and it comes time to play, what's going to happen? <laughs> Not music. I can tell you that. And you all deserve it. You're here because you know, you just, you have a dream one, but you also believe you deserve it. You know, you, you knowing what to do is the first step. Yes. Having a team that will support you is also crucial. And, you know, it's, it, I hope everyone here feels they have that, that support system that they can take back after this webinar and say, Hey, like, let's work on this together. What do you think of this? What sounds better out of these four lines? If not, that's what we're here for too. We love meeting with business owners. We love helping them with this, right. And our mission we believe in life, it's Zig Ziglar quote, you can get everything you want if you have everyone else get they want. Our job is to provide you value, right? And, and if we don't provide you so much value in a meeting that you want to know more about working with us, then, you know, shame on us, that's okay. Take the, take the next steps, the right next step for you to make this easier. Because a lot of times our only regret is not gonna be doing these things sooner. Caroline, inspired and innovative teams or every employee. Okay, so, you know, do some A-B testing and see what, uh, what works better. And, uh, you know, maybe a good, one idea that I have for, for everyone here is, you know, you put a, create a LinkedIn poll and they, they limit you on the character. So it's really going to have to be like one to five word taglines. But, you know, you can create a poll on LinkedIn and have like ask your community, you know, what are out of these four different, uh, these four different sentences or openers, what do you think resonates the most? If you do that, tag me. I'd love to vote. I'd love to participate. Rob took action and Rob trained with us. The longer you wait, that's revenue than missing out on, right? The important part here is to take action. It's like magic or something. When you do put the time in, when you do follow a proven process or a recipe, so we're, we have these webinars to provide the information. Yes, we have more services to go deeper. Either way, when you, when you take this and apply it, it, will, it could and it will be like magic for you. We have offerings. We've recently, uh, we have embraced a subscription model. We wanna make it as easy as possible for people to make that decision that they're gonna invest, right? And you can join on a monthly basis. We have different types of plans. Ultimately though, that's not, that's not something we, we, we need to talk about or to worry about at this moment. You know, we like to meet with you first and take it, you know, take 20 minutes to talk more, right? Specifically, diving deeper around your business, your challenges, right? So, you know, you will receive a call. We want to learn more about you. So some of you on the webinar here, how we've had that call, we've spoken and we're going to speak again because this is, a, this is a relationship. And, you know, ultimately if we can help each other and we can sing each other's praises, we're going to leave both of us better off in the end. And there's a meeting here to schedule that meeting directly, a link to schedule that meeting directly. So if, you know, Neezy, if you're able to put that in the chat to make it easy for people to book, go ahead and do that. And uh, I would love to spend 20 minutes and see how far we can take this with anyone who's here on the webinar. 
or if you want to share that link with someone you know you think it could bring tremendous value with, I would love that opportunity as well. Nabil did train with us. He became a student. He knows we're fair, we're reasonable. I feel like you really underpriced the course for the value I receive. Good. You know, we, we want to bring more value than we, we want to provide more value, right? Than we um, believe we're, we're gaining out of the transaction. That's the only way to, to create long-term sustainable success. That's the only way to feel good after your transaction. And if you want the slides, we can provide that as well. There was a lot of great information today on these slides. You know, go back. Just because you heard something once doesn't mean you know it. Um, it's, it's about reference. If it's about circling back. So we're going to send you these slides. We're going to send you an email with a recording as well. And we're going to reach out to you and uh, set up a time to talk more. Tasha, thank you so much. Awesome for the great info. Yes, we love you too. Love it. Thank you so much. And thank you, Neezy, for setting up a time. I mean, uh, setting up the link to book a time with myself or Kim, who um, also, you know, loves to dig in, especially on this specific topic. She did this webinar again just a few months ago. We love it so much that we want to do it again. And I mentioned before, you know, and I hope everyone here agrees, we can have everything we want if we just help enough other people get what they want. And that is so in the spirit of what we did today, right? We're creating our openers to start a conversation to help people get what they want. End result, we'll get what we want, our dreams, the dreams we deserve. Go ahead and let me know as we wrap up here, what is the one thing you took away from today? So there's information we can go back to, right? But if there's one thing that right now resonates the most, what is that one thing that you took away from today that you'll take action on today? How will you improve your opener? Okay, good. Yeah, Jim, revise my subject line. Yes, subject lines are very important, right? You know, if the email is not being opened, the email doesn't exist. It's like if the tree falls in the wood, uh, the woods and no one hears it, doesn't make a sound. I don't know, but I can tell you that an unread email is not an effective email. Right. Before we wrap up here, uh, does anyone have any questions? What questions do you have? All right, I don't see any immediate questions, so I will go ahead and wrap up, but it was a pleasure to have everybody for this 50 minutes. I hope you found it valuable. We are here every Wednesday for a webinar on various topics. Uh, and yes, Courtney is, oh, so yes, the answer is yes, the slides and recording will be available. We'll be following up with those. All right, everybody. Thank you so much, and uh, we hope to see you soon.